Welcome everybody to another edition of Take the Hill, where we connect you with individuals exhibiting significant leadership within their respective fields. So Angelo, welcome back to the show. Hello, Patrick. It is good to be here. Happy Friday to you. It's a wonderful Friday. So as you may notice, we're short one crew member. Dennis is unable to join today, but again, we want to give a big shout out to him and he's going to be joining us here uh, very soon as well in the near future. I uh, just had a few prior commitments, but um, we have the great honor today uh, to speak with an individual that I think uh, Angela and I will agree is extremely passionate about leadership, management, life, strategic planning, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And and we are just so honored to welcome to the show today, and I'm going to call him this, Dr. Don Green, president of Point Park University. Hey, Patrick. Hey, Angelo. How are you both doing today? We are fantastic. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Excited to be here. Awesome. Well, Don, I know, like you said, you're, you're not a big fan of the doctor, so I did have to add that in the beginning there. Yeah, so, you know, I just tend to go by Don. <laughs> Awesome. So, and, and that's one of the things we'll, we'll talk about here in a little bit, but just for our audience, uh, could you just give us a little background on kind of your story and your journey uh, to Point Park University? Sure. Uh, let me give you a couple of quick anecdotes. So one of those, I started out in the metal stamping industry and had no plans or intentions to be in higher education. This was over 30 years ago. And uh, one day I received a call from a dean of a school of business who asked me, uh, kind of a little bit about my background, and I guess had been talking to a trade association and learned a, bit, a little bit about who I was. Um, after answering a few of those questions, I said, so what is this all about? And he asked, uh, would you ever like to teach a class? And I thought about it for a little bit. And I said, um, when does it start? And he said, tonight. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, I thought about it again for a nanosecond, and I said, yeah, I'd like to do that. I'll be over at noon, I'll pick up the syllabus, and we can talk a little bit. Went into class, I was the youngest person in, in the class, it was a student, all non-traditional students, and had a blast, just had a great time. Got home that night, couldn't sleep, I was so full of adrenaline, about three in the morning, I rolled over, told my wife, we were fairly newly married, I said, you know, I think I figured out what I want to do with my life. She wasn't quite as excited about the epiphany at three in the morning. But uh, that really kind of changed the trajectory for me. And, and then from there, uh, one thing led to another. And I knew I wanted to be a president someday. And uh, let's see. From there, I had one presidency. Uh, I spent seven years in, down in Georgia with the University System of Georgia at Georgia Highlands College. Loved my experience. Uh, but I wanted something more, something more challenging, something that provided greater opportunity to be in a, to create innovation. And uh, all of a sudden I was approached by a recruiter concerning Point Park University. One thing led to another and here I am. So that's the very short bio. How about that? Love it. I like it. So as you reflect upon, you know, that pathway, right, that, that moved you toward that vision of becoming a presidency, what role did mentors play in that process for you specifically? You know, they were absolutely huge. When I had my first position in higher education, uh, I had a boss who was very quiet, very chill. And of course, uh, you know, I'm the exact opposite, right? Uh, my nickname from a couple of different executive assistants is Taz, because I tend to come into the office a little bit like the Tasmanian devil, just kind of like that. And so we really kind of played off from each other. You know, he was the, the very calm, chill guy. And here I am. And uh, one day I walked in and said, okay, I'm still trying to learn this higher ed thing. And I need a mentor. Do you think you'd want to do it? And he looked at me and he just thought about it for a moment. And he said, yeah. And that was it. That was the whole discussion. And then after that, everything changed. You know, it stopped being a supervisor relationship and it started being a teaching relationship. And he just started guiding the direction I was going to go. We started talking more about strategy. We started talking about what we wanted and a future vision for the organization. And, and from there, I really believe that it completely changed my work life. 
And I love that you talk about that nickname, right? <laughs> so that's a pretty unique one. I don't think we've heard Taz before. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Angelo. But so thinking about that type of personality, though, because I think I'm in a way the same way. And I know Steve is and people around me are always like, oh, here comes Patrick with another new idea. How, how did you learn to, to kind of channel that energy and that passion and then really make it purposeful or strategic because i think that's yeah. okay well let's start by saying you made a reference to steve so that for all <laughs> of you folks out there is patrick's boss he's the dean of the school of business at point park university um well it, it really requires quiet time and getting away from a lot of outside stimulus and prior to taping you and i were talking a little bit about things like whiteboards for me, I think better when I'm drawing pictures, putting up words, writing lines and circles, and I need to get away and find a whiteboard and begin to take all of these different diverse ideas bounce around in my head and really put them down on paper. And I find that actually paper doesn't work for me. I'm better when I have a nice big visual representation of what I'm thinking. And then I just begin to create the relationships that are going to allow to be able to build a greater future, greater opportunity. Uh, so what does that really, what does that require? And I think it requires um, some form of method, some kind of process, and being able to take all of those wild, creative, innovative ideas that I like to bounce around and then being able to put those in some kind of linear fashion and ask myself, who do I need to have for partners as I pursue these various uh, objectives? So Don, you mentioned as we were talking about mentors, how you had one who just kind of, it seems like almost organically it happened and, and kind of came to fruition. I teach a business career prep class in the school of business. And we recently were talking about the importance of acquiring a mentor, mentors, multiple. What kind of advice would you give to students as they're heading into that phase where they, they really should be seeking out these kinds of people to take them under their wing and to kind of help them learn an industry as a you know new product, a new graduate? What, what kind of advice would you give to, to, to seek out and to find an impactful mentor? Well, I, I would say first and foremost, understand your organization seek first to understand before seeking to be understood and step back, analyze the people around you. What qualities do they possess? How do they fit with you? And I think there's a knee jerk reaction to say, well, I want to find somebody as a mentor who's like me. And in my case, the exact opposite was actually extremely effective. And in fact, I would take that and extrapolate that idea to also be a, a dictum of leadership, right? That whatever your style, whatever your way of thinking and behaving, try to find people who are different from you and surround yourself with people who have different perspectives. It's extremely valuable that we do that. And I think it's the same with a mentor relationship. There's another piece to this. You're making a contract when you specifically ask someone to mentor you. And you better think about what's your part of the contract. And you might want to discuss with your potential mentor what their part of the contract is. Because mentorship can take lots of different directions. And it's probably a good idea to ask a couple of questions or answer a couple of questions. Why do I want a mentor? Why does this person want to mentor me? What does it mean to me to have a mentor? And what does it mean to someone else to be a mentor? You know, just trying to clarify all of that up front is extremely valuable. Because that way, you're coming into the relationship with a very open and shared understanding. It's a great question, Angela. I mean, I've really never thought about it, but it is extremely important that we 
we have a social contract in, in essence, right? Absolutely. And to kind of piggyback off of that slightly, a, a advice that I give to my students, and I feel like you kind of touched upon it in a sense, is to be, I recommend that they seek out like underclassmen, freshmen, sophomore, and be a mentor to them so that they can learn the things that they would want to seek out with their mentor and to almost pay it forward. Do you believe in that approach? And, and what kind of advice would you give toward that? I think it's beautiful. I think that advice is beautiful. And here's, here's what I will say. The minute you start feeling sorry for yourself, the minute that you see the world in a negative light, go mentor someone else, go help someone else, go serve someone else. It's going to change your outlook. And, and I really think for me, at least, that's the only thing that will change my perspective is to begin to serve others. Could you talk a little bit more about that idea of serving others? Because I know in, in a lot of the examples around campus, and I hear you speak and I hear you engaging others, you bring up the word love. And I think people are sometimes afraid to use that word. They are. For whatever yeah. reasons. But yeah, you're but I think without that, you can't really have an authentic relationship. Yeah, you're right. One of the things that you and I talked about with some of your students in class one day was there are different forms of love, right? And, and so there is certainly a, a romantic love, but there's also just a care for your, your fellow human being, right? An opportunity to provide assistance to your colleagues, to serve others. You know, those are all forms of love in our society. And here's another form, and it's, it's more of a selfish one, and that is, what do you want out of your life? Well, how do you wish to succeed? How do you want to spend your 24 hours each day? Because I hear people all the time who say, well, I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. We've all got the same amount of time. The question is, how are we spending it? And so if you really want to spend it in a meaningful way, ask how you can give back, how you can serve others, how you can help elevate other people. You know, what I love about working in education as an, an industry and as a career is that you not only change lives, you change people's trajectory and you change family trees. So the work that we do may pay off four generations down the road. And that's okay with me. I don't need to see all the results as long as I know I'm planting seeds that are ultimately going to germinate. How do you keep that how do you keep that vision in focus given the complexity and challenges that you see at the strategic level? Well, it, and this this circles back to love again. Surround yourself with people who really care about you. Surround yourself with people who really understand your vision, your motivation, your desires. I mean, I love my wife for a lot of reasons, but one of them is just her common sense. When I do get frustrated, she will come alongside me and say, okay, do you still love your students? Yeah. Do you still love your faculty? Absolutely. Do you still love your staff? Definitely. She's like, okay, so what's the problem? You have a minor impediment. And you're just allowing it to cloud your vision about what it is that you're really here to do. And, and you need those people, those people who can speak truth to you and who can kind of bring you back to center. Patrick, were you going to piggyback off of that? Yeah, I was going to say talking, you know, truth to power. That's Angelo's role here. It keeps my ego in check. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> you know what? Truth to power is huge. I really think so. You know, one of the things as I was thinking about our conversation today that I felt was super important is that too many leaders take themselves way too seriously, way too seriously. And, you know, I know that at some point you're going to give me some abuse about the fact that I go by Don and not by Dr. Green or President Green and all that stuff, right? But it's not just, it's not just a shtick, right? It's, it's real. And it's, it's just about being approachable. I want to make sure that I am approachable and that I'm a colleague 
And when I say that, it's not just for faculty and staff, it's for students as well, right? I want them to feel that they have total access to their education and to all of the people who are part of the institution. And you know, that that's hard to do 24 seven and get your job done. But at the same time, just being approachable is extremely important. Taking yourself too seriously, you know, if if you expect everything in organizational leadership to be perfect, and if you maintain your identity based on perfection, you're going to go crazy. You know, it's just it, the frustration will be huge. And so for me, at least, I think a part of that becomes understanding that leadership is messy, that organizational development is messy, and that no organization out there runs on perfection. And so you, you have to be able to just have those really honest conversations. And the best way to do that is just two people having very, very serious, but very clear conversations about what it is that, that you wish to achieve. And the whole hierarchical thing can get in the way of that. Um, my best conversations are when people tell me I'm full of crap. And it happens, trust me. So, I mean, I'm kind of curious, why, why are those some of the best conversations? Is it because it challenges you? Does it open up a particular kind of dialogue that wouldn't exist? Can you expand on that slightly? Sure, yeah. Any leader or any, leader or any manager um, has to have a game plan, right? Whether you're coaching or you're conducting uh, an orchestra, whether you're running a manufacturing plant or you're running McDonald's, you got to have a game plan and you got to know who your team is, who, whatever that team might be. That doesn't mean you have all the answers. And if you become so tied to your plan and you believe it to be perfect, you are setting yourself up for failure. But if you're open and you're willing to hear feedback and other people's thoughts, you dramatically expand your opportunity to be creative, to innovate, to build bigger opportunity for your organization. But more importantly, you build that relationship with your colleagues where they're far more willing to put it out there for you at the same time. So it's really about trust. And you know, I know people, people kind of roll their eyes about how uh, it's cliche or whatever. But honestly, probably one of the greatest talents a leader can have, talents, attributes, probably one of the best attributes is to be vulnerable, right? To be willing to be vulnerable. Put away the facade, don't assume perfection, and just go out there with a very clear vision and ask your colleagues to help you to get there. And I like, I like the word vulnerable because I think it ties back to that idea of exactly what you talked about earlier. When we look at mentors, why don't we take to typically look at people that look like us or act like us or behave like us? And it takes a certain sense of vulnerability or willingness to step outside of that comfort zone to be questioned. Yeah. Judged, right. Especially when, again, you may perceive yourself to have all those answers perhaps. So. No, you're absolutely right. Well, and Patrick, you know, that one of my kind of, one of my hobbies is personal finance you know, I love that. I love studying the market. And so periodically I will read books or other materials from people who are truly experts in that industry. And I, it really hit me and I'm trying to remember who it was I read this from, but I thought it was great that this writer suggested that at least one of your mentors needs to be a generation younger than you. And I will tell you that some of the best advice that I get is actually from my, my kids and they're 23, 26, 29. And they, they're more than willing to challenge me about a variety of things. And, you know, sometimes I'm like, yeah, whatever. Right. But of course they're going, whatever boomer that, that dialogue is so powerful. It's so useful. And I so I, that's one of the reasons I love talking with students around point park university, because when they do get comfortable with talking truth to you, you can, you can learn a lot that 
perhaps you have not perceived and in part because of your age or your generation, you know, we are what we were when. And our lives definitely affect us. They change our perspective. And one of the best ways that you can break through that periodically is by having that exchange with someone who's had a very different experience. So I want to go ahead, Angela. Uh, I want to just slightly um, touch on the approachability aspect that you had mentioned um, because you brought up talking to students and off the air, we were, you know, discussing how you just this week, Don, uh, talked to three university 101 university city life classes. Mine was part of that group. And you're actually going around and speaking to every single section. I, that's yeah. got to be like 20 some sections of class. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so very impressive. Um, I, and I, I talked to my students yesterday on Thursday at the time of this taping and wanted to get their impressions of, of what was it like to hear from the president? You know, what did you think about him beforehand? What do you think of him now? And the consensus really was just how approachable, how down to earth, how much of a human. And it's, it's crazy like that, you know, they're looking at you as a human, like, why aren't they looking at you as a human from the beginning? Right. But clearly you have this ability to appear approachable and to actually be approachable to students. Why is this such a focus for you being a brand new president at a university? I couldn't imagine committing to 20 some sections to go and speak to them. Why is this so important to you to do this? Well, that's a long story. So hold on. Uh, neither my mom nor dad had a high school diploma. And my dad was abandoned by his father when he was about 12 or 13 years old. And he was left with one thing, a goat, a pet goat. That was it. And he had to make his way in the world. And so as he raised me, it was extremely important for him that I did not have that kind of life experience. And so for both my mother and father, they said, you're going to go to school because they figured out somewhere along the way that having that education was going to completely change their lives. And they hadn't had that opportunity. So they wanted it for their kids. So you fast forward. Education has served me well. I've been blessed. And I'm fortunate that my parents had that mindset. But there are so many students every year who don't graduate, right? So for people listening to this podcast, if you don't take anything else away from it, when you're talking to young people, please do not tell them to go to college. Please tell them to graduate from college. Because every year, a large percentage of students head off to various schools across the country. And Point Park University has a very good completion rate. But still, there are students all across the country who go to college and they never finish. And so from the time I was young, it was kind of stressed to me that I needed to finish and that it was going to change my life. And I'm just passing that on to others. And I wanna make sure that they succeed. So that's one piece of it. So obviously, as you can tell, my dad was a big part of my life. And one of the things he raised me about was everyone has the right for equal respect. And one of the ways that we can show respect to others is by helping everyone, serving everyone, by helping them to be able to complete their education, and be able to ultimately reach whatever objectives that they wish to have in their life. So this is really a generational thing for me, Angelo. It's, it's a part of who I am and it's part of what I wanna be. I guess it's part of what I want for my legacy. And from a leadership role, by the way, Patrick, um, never underestimate the value of legacy in how people perform in their lives and in their work and in their organizations. So many years ago, I had a faculty member 
I mean, this was a long time ago. I had a faculty member who could tell you to the day when they were going to retire. And curmudgeon would be a nice word to describe this person. And their fellow faculty members were just waiting for them to retire. And one day, very early in the morning, that person happened to get to work about the same time I did. And there was nobody else around. And I had a very honest heart to heart conversation with this person about how they were perceived. Because they had once again reminded me how long it was before they were going to get to retire. And I just said, hey, when you retire and you leave here, this is what your colleagues are going to be saying. And I said, you know, do me a favor. Think about it for the next week. Is that really what you want? And that person came back and said, it's not what I want. How are we going to change this? The person became a department head and completely, completely um, revitalized an academic department in that particular institution. And I would say that the message was very different when that person ultimately did retire. That's interesting because I know very powerful words, you know, first of all, I know that line of thinking, you know, I think sometimes it's hard to, to be in that mindset early on in your career, but there's a definitive point in time, I believe that it starts to have an impact if you pay attention to that message. And I know I've talked to Keisha Lalama, yeah, performing arts and her, her podcast as well. Keisha's yeah. amazing. She's unbelievable. But that's, it was around that very idea. Like it's, yes, it's fulfilling and what we're doing, but at the same time, it's not necessarily about us in the moment right now. It's about, as you said, you're impacting generations and family trees. And if you start to grasp the levity behind that, I think your actions and your decisions and the way you approach conversations changes. I, I agree hundred percent. So one, one part of that, and I kind of want to shift the conversation a little bit, is our students. What most excites you about our student body now that you've had or are having a chance to engage with them so closely? Anytime that you, you are able to combine huge creativity with huge energy, you're going to get amazing products, right? That's where we're at with this, with this student body. They are unbelievable. And just such a, a variety of objectives, vision, plans that they have for their life. It's, it's tremendous. And I've never seen a student body that is so comfortable with pursuing not one, but multiple career objectives while still being undergrad or graduate students, right? So you've got... So, uh, so many students at Point Park University that, you know, you ask them, what is it that you want to do with your degree? And they don't give you one answer. They give you like three, four, five. And, and I love that. You know, I love that because uh, I, would, I, would actually, I would actually mourn for them if they said, this is what I want to do. And I want to do that for the rest of my life. Right. But just the multitude of different objectives that they have for themselves, that is huge. And, and you know they're going to do it. I mean, because they're just coming at it so aggressively and so positively. It's terrific. So, Don, earlier today I was in a meeting with my bosses, Keith Palo and Michael Gieske, and I was telling them, how excited I was that later today I was going to get the opportunity to talk to you for this podcast. How disappointing for you. <laughs> so, so Keith asked me, what, what are you guys going to be talking about? And, you know, I, I kind of read, you know, off our sheet, just some of the, the things. And, and I had mentioned that we're also going to talk about music and maybe some food and stuff from Pittsburgh that you have tried. And Keith goes, man, Don Green just is into so many different things. Like he said, you have all these hobbies like scuba diving and stuff. Um, it, 
so it, it's 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 interesting how many layers there are to you and your interests and all that. But I too am very very big into music. I have my own music podcast that I uh, do outside of this. I give opportunities to students both at Point Park and around the country. And even before we started taping, you were alluding to like the '80s punk scene. So you you, you surely seem to have an eclectic taste. But w- what is music to you? Like what what does music do for you? Why are you interested in music? Why would you consider it uh, a hobby if you do? Sure. Uh, Music touches emotions in you that otherwise are typically covered up, right? We, We have to go through life quite often with this facade about who we are. I mean, it's just part of society, right? And I like to say that we're all still six, seven, eight-year-olds, we've just been able to put on a whole lot of coverings, right? A lot of masks, a lot of makeup that that covers this up. But honestly, there's still a whole lot of prefrontal cortex that's that's shouting that it still wants its attention. And um, music allows you to get to that. And, and if I can go tangential on you for a minute here, Angelo, please. One of the things that I love is with, for instance, uh, Spotify. Last night, I'm sitting here texting with my two sons who are both in different places. And we've all got Spotify on. And we're just bouncing back and forth between people, each other's different favorite songs. And there is, there are no limitations. So you know, my youngest, who is uh, what, 22, 22 years old, 23 years old, um, you know, he's like, and this song from Jim Croce, literally texted to him, oh, I remember that song. I listened to it over and over when I was in eighth grade. And I think he was just like, eighth grade, what? <laughs> but the beauty now with technology is that it's all there. It's all at your fingertips. And the opportunity for a 20 year old to be able to appreciate something from the sixties or seventies easily, right. Totally accessible, but also for me to be able to listen to rap and hip hop and hear what the latest drop was and be able to immediately access some of that music. It, it tends to bind us together in ways where in the past, uh, generations have separated us. So, you know, I love that. And then, then it becomes about emotions. The other thing I have found is, you know, one of the things and you, I know you heard me say this in class the other day, Angelo, but what's the greatest form of diversity that we have, right? And people always think about physical diversity, but the greatest diversity is how we think, because none of us think the same way, right? And if we can appreciate that diversity and really take advantage of it as we try to create, as we try to, um, to accomplish, it's, it's fabulous. Well, that's also where I am starting to appreciate how musically different from an intellectual standpoint, my family is. So I've got one kid that will come home from a movie and say, I picked up this song and this song and this song from the soundtrack. Did you hear that? And I'm like, no, I wasn't even listening to the soundtrack. I had no clue that those were even in the soundtrack. Right. And then, and then he will go into detail to tell you about the emotional hook that he believes that the director was using by with that particular song. That is an intelligence all unto itself. Right. By the way, just an aside for any of you that are interested in multiple intelligences theory, Howard Gardner, read the stuff. It'll blow your mind. And musical is a form of uh, one of the form of multiple intelligences. So, yeah, but uh, I hope that's enough riffing for you. Oh, and if you're wondering, like, who do I love? I do. uh, (laughs) The list goes on and on. It's it's tough. Um, So I. I range from uh, certainly Gordon Lightfoot to Pink Floyd to The Who to The Clash 
to Snoop Dogg. That's just a few of them. Uh, and and I'm awesome. sure that I, I'm missing about a dozen more that I should be naming. Because uh, there's, oh, I'm going to see the Stones next weekend again. So I'm excited about that as well. Um, I think, you know, I actually, I actually told this story on a video with um, some Point Park folks. But uh, one of my sons, uh, he and I had the opportunity to go down and see the Stones pre-pandemic down in Jacksonville. And this is just such a great story. So, you know, everybody's just sitting in the stadium, right? You're in a football stadium and everybody's just sitting there chatting and talking and all of a sudden, boom, all the lights go out and it's just dark across the entire stadium. And then you hear the background singers who are starting sympathy for the devil. And it's who, 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 and the whole crowd joins in oh. and you can feel the sound of an entire stadium of people singing a cappella, And then, <clears throat> boom, a spotlight comes on in the middle of the stadium on a peninsula out from the stage. And here's Mick starting with, please allow me to introduce myself. And the place just erupts. It was just such a great live experience. And driven by emotion. Yeah. So you, you oh, feel it. no doubt about it. You're it right. Down. I mean, it, it was down. it was an experience that was designed mm -hmm. by someone who said, we're going to evoke a particular emotion from 100,000 people or whatever, mm -hmm. right? It's amazing. Angel loves the Beatles. In fact, he has two dogs named after him. And okay. It seems, our, it seems our fans are on both sides. Some people love them. Some people don't. Love Maybe the Beatles. Love the Beatles. And I will tell you why. Um, love their music. But what I love is their ability to influence other people's music. Because when you look at the next 40 years after the Beatles, you will see so many people and so many influences, right? From folk to the application of Indian sitar mm -hmm. to bringing uh, orchestral movements into rock and roll. And even pre Pink Floyd, bringing sound bites into music, right? All of those things were the Beatles. And I mean, it took me years to recognize that these four people were not were were willing let's say it from a positive standpoint were willing to risk their current audience to say this album's going to be completely different and they just kept evolving and probably would have gone on so much further had it not been for the breakup but that's another story <laughs> that is another story. Now, do you, are you partial to any one of the four Beatles? I feel like it's kind of like a unofficial personality test whenever people. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's so hard because, uh, okay. So Angelo Ringo Starr's real name is uh, Richard Starkey. Nice. Very well. well. Very well played. Good job. Okay. So, you know, Ringo had his qualities still does. Uh, and uh, I love how supportive he was. I love George because in many ways he was the spiritual leader of the band. And, and I think he more than any other member really grieved at their breakup. I mean, my guitar, I still, when I hear my guitar gently weeps, I'm thinking about the mourning that he is going through because he knows he's losing three amazing friends of his. Paul could walk down the street, hum some tune. And by the time he got back to the house, it was a top 10 hit. It's ridiculous, right? If any of, any of your viewers are, um, were readers of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, there is a reoccurring joke 
about songs that that Paul McCartney would make millions of pounds off from, right? So that's there. John, idealistic, right? So passionate. So I am going to totally wimp out and not give you a favorite because I can give you reasons that I really appreciate every one of them. They all just had great, great qualities, as do a lot of other amazing musicians, right? I mean, it, it goes beyond the Beatles. It just happened that they were probably one of the first to really influence, especially when you're looking outside the United States. And, and if, you, you know, if you want to look back to Mississippi Delta Blues and that influence, which ultimately created the Beatles and created so many other bands, right? But if you're really looking at that, that boomerang effect of coming back to the States, the Beatles were the first ones. And I think that's why they're just so important. Awesome. Is that enough? That, that's perfect. All right. <laughs> perfect amount. <laughs> so Don, you know, you've been in Pittsburgh for a while. You know, what do you love about the city? Food, culture, destinations? Uh, I love food. It's, it's a little hard because when I came to interview, this place was still shut down. I mean, the whole city was still shut down. And I'm slowly seeing it open up. And maybe that's good because then I slowly get to discover places that I'm enjoying, whether it's um, proper brick oven where I was the other night or gaucho. Oh, you know, God, if you get yeah. the chance to go up on, on the roof at gaucho and just kind of watch the, the sun go down and the lights go up, how cool awesome. is that, right? And there are a lot of Point Park students who work at Gaucho. So it's just automatic relationships there. Pramadis, you got to do it, right? You got to do that. Um, it's just, it's part of who we are. Walking down the strip district and just exploring eateries and, and sometimes just street food on the strip district is amazing. So that's very cool. But you, you know, you're, you started with a, a more broad question, Patrick, which was just about the city as a whole. The bridges. They just add a complete, completely different dimension that other cities don't have. You know, lots of cities have rivers, but they don't have the kind of amazing bridges and architecture. The architecture of Pittsburgh is off the charts and it doesn't get mentioned enough, right? But periodically I see people with cameras walking around nearly getting hit with cars because they're too busy looking at gargoyles or looking at facades at the top of, of buildings. It's, it's amazing. The uh, pro sports teams are unbelievable. I have gotten the opportunity to meet so many people from the various sports teams in Pittsburgh. Uh, I never had that opportunity in Atlanta. It's just because people, when people talk about Pittsburgh being a big, small town or a small, big town, but really a big, small town, it's so true. So true. You can build relationships. You know, I was, I was at an event and just so casually, somebody that was there said, hey, would you like to meet Franco Harris? And there's <laughs> a gentleman in front of me who just takes down his mask. And I am seldom dumbstruck like where I can't say anything. And I'm just sitting there with my jaw hanging out. And, and Mr. Harris just smiled, that smile that he has. And he, he's just such a, a genuine person. Uh, you, don't, you, know, you don't get that in a lot of cities across America. So that was very cool. The cultural district, you know, all of the different things that we have going on. One day I was over at the Allegheny Conference offices and I, you know, I was just saying how per capita, there cannot be this many cultural venues in any other city in America. And I can't remember what they said, but they said, yeah, we're number two for culture, cultural venues per capita uh, in America. And now I wish I could tell you who is number one. I can't even remember off the top of my head, but I mean, you know, does New York have more venues? Sure. But do they have a whole lot more people? Absolutely. Sure. <laughs> Here, you can get in to events. You can get tickets for events. And um, sorry, but if you're a Pittsburgh out there and you are complaining about your winter, <laughs> move to West Michigan. It's like living in Buffalo. And if you're complaining about your traffic, 
move to Atlanta. Just saying. Because um, Pittsburgh's amazing. It is a cool place. And I guess go Atlanta Braves, right? World Series, ah, uh, yeah. Right? yeah. So, uh, That's my awesome. National League team. So I was <laughs> pretty psyched about that. Right. And and uh, I, Kathy and I stayed up way too late the last <laughs> week or so. I mean, man. But it was great. Yeah. Awesome. So, Don, as we are wrapping up here with this uh, very uh, eclectic, intriguing conversation. <laughs> 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 you like that. <laughs> um, I want to just kind of give you the opportunity to give any kind of final thoughts that you might want to share with the students, with the audience, uh, with the Point Park community at large, anything that you want to share here at the end. Uh, sure. People ask me, what made you decide that you wanted to come to Point Park University? And the word that pops into my mind most is opportunity not opportunity for me, it's opportunity for students, opportunity for anybody involved with our university community. So what I found so fascinating was that you can have an idea and you can launch it in a week. The bureaucracy is small. The opportunity is huge. And I see students every day who are saying, you know, I think I would like a career someday working in the NFL. And people say, cool, next semester, we'll have you over working for the Steelers, right? Or students saying, you know, I think I would really like to be a screenwriter in Hollywood. And having people say, great, why don't we start with you writing a stage play that we can perform right here at the university? Those opportunities are everywhere and our students are just grabbing them and running with them. Our faculty and staff are doing amazing work in the community in ways that in a lot of institutions, it just wouldn't be allowed. So that is so cool, it's so exciting. And I just, I want, to encourage the students who listen to this podcast to start dreaming, imagining what they might want to be, what they might want to experience, what they might want to pursue, and then just asking themselves, all right, who do I need to talk to? Because there are opportunities all over the place here. All you have to do is dream it and do it. Awesome. Well, Don, thank you. Hey, again, we truly appreciate the time you take. And like I said, you got a pretty packed schedule uh, throughout the week. And like I said, we appreciate it. I know our audience appreciates it. And I think, you know, the key words and some of the main ideas that you were talking about today in terms of, you know, appreciating the diversity, finding passion and purpose, and most importantly, dreaming, but then sharing those dreams with others so yeah. that we can collectively find ways to make them come true. Um, those are eternal topics that I think are woven through many of our podcasts and, uh, you know, I look forward to sharing this conversation with our audience. And again, thank you so much for being here today. We truly appreciate your time. Oh, no, thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. And nice synopsis, Patrick. Very good. We didn't even get a chance to talk about transformational leadership, <laughs> I mean, per se. Well, so, I'll tell you what, that's uh, uh, round two, right? Absolutely. I look forward All to right. uh, an invite. It'll be certainly sent your way. Thank you, Don. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. 